yesterday, for example, about uh, the IP stack for Linux is an accomplishment. Um, it has proven to be a solid, stable, well-deployed networking stack, and most importantly, under continual improvement. You know, how we can continue to make things better from congestion control algorithms, ways to improve our throughput and, and, in, and latency, of course. And as with, uh, with Ratchet, we're looking well beyond today's 100G. We're looking at 200, 400, 800G. Like, how do we make sure the software is going to scale to those points? Um, so last month at Linux Plumbers Conference, I gave a talk about the Linux networking stack and how it scales and what software needs for a single flow to scale up as line rates increase. An important takeaway from that talk is that the core of the networking stack, specifically the IP TCP layers, they are quite capable of running at 800 gigs. It's the surrounding OS infrastructure that brings in all the overhead, limiting what we can do, increasing CPU cycles per packet, and thus limiting our flow rates. And so today, I want to talk about how existing code um, within the Linux kernel um, yeah, this is my notes. <laughs> so when my brain wanders, this thing kind of refreshes me to come back. Um, so anyway, uh, so what I want to talk about today is how there's existing code within the Linux kernel. We can wire this up in a different way, and I think we can solve some of the, or most of the properties that we need to be running at these really high flow rates. Okay, so if I hit this mouse, do I get to go to the next slide? In fact, I do. Okay, let's start with the, with the current APIs, BSD socket APIs, ubiquitous. They've been around for 40 years, you know, about, about 40 years. Um, if you want to talk to some host or some application or other host, you're most likely going to use socket APIs, well-known interface. Um, you have libc, for example, that provides this, this interface for applications so they don't have to under system calls. Um, and you're relying on the OS for your abstractions, for things like your network addressing, your routing, who's your next hop, what's its address, how the segmentation is going to happen, how are we going to queue this thing up, how are we going to actually send it on the wire, right? So this is what the OS provides for us. But with those simplicity comes well-known overhead. It's been well discussed today. So we're going to continue on. And we're going to run through this really quickly. Because I does think it's I think it's getting kind of repetitive. Um, you've got system calls to push a buffer down into the kernel to say, hey, send this through my socket to the remote. You have memcopy to pull that buffer from user space down into kernel space. For TX, the kernel side of it, it's got to have its own allocation for a buffer. Where am I going to copy this data to, for example? We go down the stack. We've got um, the L3 layers got to do a fib lookup. Where am I sending this packet? Is it local? Is it remote? Maybe I can stash this if it's a TCP socket and it's fairly stable. Uh, we've got protocol headers that have to be created on TX or validated on RX. Um, for RX, we've got to find, you know, got to do a socket lookup and say, well, is there anything listening for this packet? Do I need, to, you know, is, is something waiting for it? And do I have, how do I look it up and attach this packet? Um, we have infrastructure for, for various policies like NetFilter and TC. And of course, the well-known now eBPF hooks that are spreading like wildfire. Um, we have GRO pa uh, packet processing on RX. So it's an attempt to make things faster, but it takes a lot of CPU cycles to go through these packet headers to say, do these two, these two packets belong to the same flow? Can I consolidate the data to make it one less packet going up to the software stack? All of this results in a lot of overhead at this core layer. Going down to the driver layer, driver's got to manage, manage packet buffers, right? It's got to allocate. If you're running at uh, 100 gig, 1500 MTU, uh, what is that? That's 8 million packets per second. You got to be allocating 8 million pages or packet buffers for this thing to land, right? So now we're getting into page management aspects. For Rx, you got to allocate an SKB because the networking stack is SKB based. So if you're going to send this thing up the stack, you got to create an SKB for it. TX, you've got to do the DMA mapping, so hardware knows where to pull the the, the the data from. You have IRQs and IRQ latency. This time it takes the hardware saying, "Hey, you got some work to do," and software says, "Okay, I'm going to get on this." And then of course you've got that system end-to-end -end effect of CPU cache locality. 
the driver's processing packets on one CPU, the application needs to be running on a sibling CPU sharing like an L3 cache, for example, right? This is all the big summaries of the LPC talk from a software perspective. The other side is things like the LRO, which is not necessarily relevant to this. It kind of falls out of it. Okay, so we have well-known overheads, well-known bottlenecks. What are some of our solutions that we can get around this to, to mitigate some of these, these the software overhead? So what we have today in Linux, we have some zero copy APIs, right? So we're gonna start off right at the very top. We're gonna go after this, this boundary between user space and kernel. We know that memory copy limits what we can do to roughly 30 gigabits per second on a really fast CPU with really fast memory, okay? Oops, I guess I need to go to my next slide. Anyway, this is meant to be a summary of all the things we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes. Okay, so let's look at the ZC APIs, right? So it's going after that boundary between um, kernel space and user space. The, the TX API, pretty easy to use, right? Because TX path is a little bit easier to manage when you're um, pinning buffers from user space and letting the hardware get access to those pages directly. But there's a little bit of overhead that comes with the API, manageable overhead, but some overhead. Rx, extremely tricky, practically impossible um, to use in a generic way, right? Uh, and then of course, the, the, the big one with Rx, even if you were to use this specific MTU and do the page flipping in the user space, which has its own overhead, you gotta have this sideband for the memory copy for those little bits that aren't quite a full page size. Okay, so TX solves some of the problem, not everything, not, a, not necessarily in a great way. As DJ mentioned, IOU ring is a new subsystem that came along trying to address this user space, kernel space boundary, right? How do we avoid system calls? System calls are a part of that overhead. We need to avoid those to, to get our, our network load out. Yep, oh. One more thing for my brain to manage while I'm talking. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I, I probably could just come over here to this diagram here. Um, so what Lib U -ring, or what uh, IO U ring is going after is you got software queues between user space and kernel space. Um, as a part of setup, you create these queues. You put an entry into the submission queue. The IO U, sub, U, IO U ring subsystem will pull those entries off do whatever work you're asking for. Maybe it's sending a message, maybe it's receiving a message, and then give you a completion, so no system calls-ish, right? Fewer system calls, really. Uh, recently, Pavel, who's here, added the TX zero copy API. We said the TX API is pretty easy to use. And so now, IOU ring can save us system calls, and it can save us mem copies on a TX. But it doesn't solve everything we need, right? we still have lots of overhead that we have to manage with an IOU ring based solution. We still gotta deal with memcopy for Rx. We still have to deal with all of the different infrastructure hooks that a generic operating system has to administer those policies. We still have the lower level device manager aspects of it, the page management that the driver has to do, the SKB allocations, the GRO packet processing, et cetera. So what's another solution? What's something else we have in the Linux kernel that can address some of these problems? Of course, they have XTP, XTP sockets, right? Option number two, they have XTP's full kernel bypass. We like the IPTCP stack. I spent a lot of time working on the IPTCP stack, right? So obviously I don't want to go around it, so why would I bring this up, right? One thing that AFXTP shows a user is this notion of user space talking to hardware, or really talking to a driver, which does some interpretations go down to hardware, right? Great, we're bypassing more infrastructure, more overhead for our data path. We also bypassed our control path. We like the control path, we like the socket path. It's that simple, easy to use, establish a connection to a peer, let the operating system take care of things like the segmentation, things like the flow control. Um, how do I even reach that, that next hop, et cetera? So it's better, but um, not a complete solution for what we're going after. 
And one of the key things I want to uh, point out about all of these, like IOU Ring and AFXDP, is that there's always libraries that come along for the ride to kind of help application developers, okay? You have to buy into this notion that you want improved performance for a particular workflow, right? Um, maybe some workflows don't need this, so you stick with the simple socket APIs. Other workflows, you're trying to really cram some data from one host to another, and so you do want this, this advanced APIs to, to get around this OS infrastructure, and so you're gonna code your application against those APIs. All right, so IOU Ring solves some of the problems. AFXDP solves more, but does a complete kernel bypass. What is something else that exists in the kernel? I know it's a dirty word to a lot of networking developers, RDMA, right? RDMA is another subsystem that exists in the Linux kernel as a way of doing high performance computing, right? That's what it's known for. But it is its own ecosystem. Everything, hardware, software, um, the way applications are written. You know, and again, even with, with InfiniBand, you have um, the IB verbs as a way to write your application as a way to understand that interface a little, little easier, right? Um, but it's an R, I mean, it's an Ethernet world, and RDMA being, or InfiniBand being its own separate ecosystem, how do we bring these two together, right? And RDMA recognizes that it's an Ethernet world through Rocky, so it, it understands that we want to have a converged network. So what can we do? Before we get to what we can do and how we can bring these together, let's talk about a few fundamental concepts. Um, Roland had a tutorial on Tuesday about RDMA much more in depth from an RDMA expert. I'm a networking engineer. I'm gonna give you a two second intro to just the concepts that we use in a demo that's coming up. Specifically, memory regions. Memory regions are an, an application registering memory with hardware so that you can amateurize all that overhead of what it means for the hardware to interact with that specific set of pages. You can amortize the setup, the page pinning, the DMA mapping, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, Q pairs. So basically just your RX and TX kind of thing. It's just a fancy name per se. We got a set of queues. They work together in different directions. Completion queue, you gotta be notified when something's done, right? So in RDMA, you're submitting work that goes right down to hardware. You gotta get a completion back for it. And their protection domain kind of brings all these things together in a kind of a security context, right? So this memory, this memory region and these few pairs, they all kind of go together. From a software architecture perspective, it looks similar to XDP, right? You've got an application in user space. Instead of having a driver do some conversions, it's going straight to hardware, right? So you have a control path going through the kernel stack, which sets this up, and then applications talk to hardware directly, right? You got a receive queue. You put some buffers into this queue. The hardware gets those buffers. When packets come in, you know, it knows where to land that particular message, for example. Send queue, kind of the same thing. Hey, send this to my peer. We've already talked about what, you know, all the specifics and stuff about where it's going. And the send queue goes out, goes down to hardware. Hardware notifies it when it's done. Okay, lovely concepts. How do we bring these together? How do we take the goodness of Linux, the socket APIs, the well-established IPTCP stack, the congestion control, the segmentation, the out-of-order handling, that retransmits, all that good stuff about IP? IP, TCP, and bypass the OS infrastructure that is just overhead for our data path. This is one proposed way of doing that. So you bring in, you leave the socket APIs for the control path. So you open a socket, you talk to your peer, you get this thing established. You use some IB verbs APIs to register some memory with hardware so that when packets from MyFlow come in, here's some memory you can land them in. Um, you've got your, in this case what we're doing is we have, our queue pairs are both hardware and software. So we'll have a unique pair of hardware queues for a specific flow, and we'll have software queues going from 
kernel space, our user space to kernel space, and we have this intermediate module. And all the orange boxes are bright orange for a reason. It's meant to say, hey, these things go together. This is the vendor glue that ties all these concepts together in a way that lets it flow very nicely, very cleanly, avoiding that overhead. So the provider has the software queues that goes to the verbs APIs to manage the queues, and you have your um, receive queue, your send queue, your completion queue. This pushes things down into the kernel module. Kernel modules, seeing those entries on the TX queue, for example, immediately sends it into the hardware queue, lets it go out, or sends it through the TCP stack, and then sends it out the hardware queue. Same thing on the RX side. Packet comes in, RSS steering says, hey, this goes with this flow. I already have some buffers for it. I'm gonna put these packets into this buffer. I'm gonna put some entries into that hardware descriptor ring. That IB module is gonna see those entries in the hardware descriptor ring. It's gonna run those RX packets through the TCP stack and then hand it off to the application, okay? Um, and then, of course, the completion queue is what's telling the user when things have been happening on the RX side and the TX side. Okay. I think I've run through all of the essential pieces of that. All right, so before I go into an example of how to do this, I wanna emphasize what, what is bypassed in this solution. What are, what are we keeping and what are we getting around? So we're keeping the socket APIs. That means we're hitting all the policy hooks for the, for the infrastructure, infrastructure policy hooks for things like NetFilter, things like TC, things like the EPPF hooks, allowing or not allowing a connection to happen. Once the connection is established, we're gonna get the OS out of the way. We're gonna let these, these different vendor components work together to streamline that data up to, from hardware up to user space. So we're basically bypassing all the kernel stack when we want to, hooking into the TCP stack only, okay? So we've decided what level of infrastructure we're gonna keep. Okay, so now I gotta write an application against IV verbs. How do I do that? Again, this is the network engineer's view of RDMA. So first you gotta find that InfiniBand device, right? So in the networking world, when a driver detects one of its hardware, it, it creates a net depth. And that net dev is a representation of that Ethernet port to the networking stack. InfiniBand has a similar virtual device that pops up in, in the kernel stack to, or in, in, to users to show, hey, there's an InfiniBand-ish device capable of understanding InfiniBand verbs, APIs, right? So you gotta find that. You gotta figure out what kind of attributes does this thing support? What can it do? How many queue entries can I have? How many memory regions can I have? How big can it be, et cetera? You gotta create that protection domain because you're gonna associate this memory region and these queues together. So we gotta have that protection domain. Next, we gotta allocate some memory for sending or receiving buffers, depending on what we're doing with our application. And then once we've allocated this huge space, we tell hardware, hey, here's some memory that belongs to us for our, for our packets. We register that memory with hardware as a memory region. We create our completion queue, this, this completion queue between the, the modules and user space that lets the, the, the InfiniBand module tell us when our, our work has been completed. And then we do this create QP. And the create QP creates both the software queues that work between the InfiniBand module and the application and the hardware queues that work from the InfiniBand module down with hardware. So this application specific queue set and then it does the RSS so that the hardware knows this flow. Um, sorry, I went ahead. <laughs> First, we got to establish that socket because we can't do an RSS without our end So now that we have all the resources set up with hardware, we do our normal socket connection. And that means we just do the normal socket APIs, right? So we're keeping our control path the same. Once that socket's established, we transition our Q pair through a few states from initialization through ready to receive, ready to send, as a part of that transition is when we hand that socket off to the InfiniBand module in the kernel, so now it's gonna manage the, the, the traffic going through it. 
and we start posting buffers. Like, so if we're a, the sender, we're going to use the IBV post send command to post buffers into our send queue so that everything is going to start flowing through hardware and out it goes, right? Or we're going to start posting buffers for the receive side. You know, out of that memory region, this piece of memory is, is available for reception at this point in time. Okay? And then, of course, at the end, after we're all done, we got to clean up our resources. Okay. So we got more than just vaporware, more than just slides. So let's, let's run through an example. And given the networking issues, I'm really glad that I have um, a recorded demo of how to do this. Yeah, that's just what I need, is my brain trying to manage multiple windows while, on a laggy network. While, while David's bringing that up, the one thing I wanted to emphasize <clears throat> Yeah, I lost my notes a long time ago, so I'm sure I forgot some very key points. No, no, I just wanted to emphasize one point. The one real interesting thing here is, uh, and I would say RDMA is networking as well, but one of the things we as a community need to understand is that the world is moving towards more and more applications that are using RDMA as, a, as an infrastructure. And RDMA does not mean InfiniBand or Rocky. RDMA to me means verbs and an application interface that is the most important thing out of all of this. And what this, what we are proposing will allow you to keep the sockets interface and the verbs interface and use them interchangeably under application control and without any real heavy lifting on that side of the, of the fence. And I think that's super important. All right. Now for a monotone um, demo recording. This is a demonstration of an application. <laughs> Then the recorded one doesn't want to. It, it's the app itself. I, I hit this a few times playing it. So I, I'm going to try to go through this. I'll move the cursor along. So the key thing it was doing is walking through everything that's going to happen with the application. We start off by showing we have a server, we have standard networking, and you can see the InfiniBand device. Well, I can't even move that out of the way. Okay, we have standard networking going with our NetDev ETH0. We have our InfiniBand device, the ENF IB devices, right? So that's what the application sees when, when I start it up. Um, it's transferring 150 meg file from one server to another, and it's doing that in a series of two meg buffers. So both RX is posting multiple sets of two meg buffers, and the TX side is posting two meg buffers and every time the, the completion comes through saying that two meg is sent, it sends another two. Um, it's an interesting suggestion. See, I knew I should have taken this over to my Mac because I never have AV problems on a Mac. Back in Linux, in Linux uh, I'm bashing something else. <laughs> Okay, so that's a good suggestion. It seems to be liking it. All right, off it goes. Let's let's see what happens. The application sends a large file from one host to another over a TCP socket. There's a control socket for exchanging metadata about the transaction. Then a data socket is established for the actual file transfer. The app uses the verbs APIs to register memory and set up queues, then makes a socket connection from client to server for usual socket APIs. On the server, On the server side, side, it posts a set of buffers for Rx to land the incoming packets, transitions, transitions the data socket to the kernel module, 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 and then the file, file transfer loop The client, the client side posts a series of two meg send buffers, send buffers until the entire the file is sent. On the server side, side as its two meg, two meg buffers are posted, are completed, it posts more buffers until the file size is 
In total, in total the, loop the loop of two, of mag, two buffers mag buffers is done 75 times to transfer the 100 mag, mag, mag file. I'm going to run the demo twice. The first run focuses on the changes for the IB verbs integration. The command has an argument to print each step that it is doing, along with a delay to see the information printed to the screen. The delay is strictly for following along with the demo and is not related to how long any of the APIs take. The second line will skip the delay. So add food, the, the driver for the FPGA is loaded, loaded along with the IB assist module. module. And a, a net, net device, device is created, created to represent, to represent the Ethernet, Ethernet connectivity, connectivity of the port or the network, network stack. Similarly, Similarly, an IB device is created, created to represent the physical, physical port, port to the IB, to the IB, IB API. API. The, screens the screens for both client and, and server show the output of both IP address show and RDMA show to show the, to show device, the device represented. Device. Now, now, moving now, to now, the, now, the receive buffers, buffers and registering the space, space for the hardware. hardware, hardware, hardware. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a simple this command. A simple again, command. again, it's a socket-based application socket doing some IB verbs-based extensions, right? <laughs> the, the anticipation of merging networking worlds. I turned the mic off. On the mic off. Completely. 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 Let me just stand over here. I don't think I heard echoes when I was standing over here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. All right. All right. If I if I stand over there, no shit, that makes it too loud. So so. <laughs> go out of the room where I can't see. Yes. Okay. I turned the microphone off on my Chromebook. Okay. 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 So I'll, let me just talk this through, and we'll put the demo online. So what it's doing the first time through is I put a delay in the command so that you can see kind of each step that goes along, right? And an important thing that I put in there is that just leave that one open, Trujit. That that slide. Um, the delay has absolutely nothing to do with how long it takes those commands to run. They all run really fast. I put a delay in there so that I can kind of talk through each step that it's doing, which is you know, opening the IB device so that it can figure out, hey, what kind of attributes does this device support? Um, creates the Q pairs, creates the memory regions, goes through all those IB verb steps that I mentioned in the API walkthrough. Then it opens up the socket, registers that buffers with the, the, the hardware, and then goes through the loop of sending and receiving the, the packets. Um, so the first time I go through this, I mean, it's kind of boring because you can send 150 megs between two servers with zero copy really fast, right? Um, the second time I, I go through it, I show that if you run TCP dump on the server, all you see is a TCP handshake, right? And that's kind of emphasizing Control path is observable through your standard TCP dump packet tools. The data path is not. But if you use tools like SS, the socket's visible to the operating system. You can still monitor it. It's still, you can still use your favorite admin tools to kind of see what's going on. You just lose access to individual packets. If you want that, I had a third window, which I ended up cutting from the demo because of time, where if you use port spanning on the switch, now you get access to all the packets that were flowing between them. You get the data path packets as well, right? So because we're using socket APIs, you're keeping the things you like and you're getting rid of or avoiding the things that just overhead. You know, specifically, um, you know, I mentioned this at LPC. I didn't really harp on it as much here. You can be running along fine and someone starts up a packet socket. Maybe someone started LLDP. Maybe someone started TCP dump and all they want to do is look at one specific connection, but all packets are getting cloned, every connection gets hit, right? 
So if you want stability, if you want that consistency, you kind of have to bypass a lot of these infrastructure hooks so that you can um, get your application running fast, stable, consistent, consistent gender, consistent latency, consistent throughput. Um, yep, there you go. There's the, the run through of what you see from the first socket connection doing the control. There's a second socket and exchanges some meta information about what's going to be transferred. There's a second socket that's getting set up for the data path. That gets handed off, and the only thing you see after that is the close. Right? Um, so really, it, it is that idea of bringing together the two worlds to keep what's good, get rid of what's bad. I think at that, we can just drop. Okay. All right. So if that I, that was the summary I just gave, which is we, we want to keep we want to keep the Linux APIs. We like those. We know them, right? Um, and all the things that Linux brings to us, but we want to avoid that infrastructure. We want to simplify the memory management. The application itself knows when it's managing its flows. It knows what buffers are available. It knows which ones can be reused to land the next set of packets. Um, we avoid. Um, a lot of that OS, but the one thing that we're keeping, though, because Linux is an SKB stack, we still have to create our SKBs to send things through the TCP IP stack, right? Or just the TCP stack, really. We avoid IP completely as well for the for the data path. It's literally pulling things off the descriptor rings. We know it's our connection. We create an SKB with the data side of it, run it through TCP to let it do the reordering, if any, let it maintain its state. Let it do its congestion control thing, its round trip time, all that kind of stuff that TCP is really good at. And then things like the hardware features like the LRO, because this is all the same vendor, right? It's the same vendor doing the provider, doing the hard IB module. It understands the descriptor formats. So if your hardware does a good LRO algorithm, then that IB app inherently can, can pull in the descriptors and consolidate those LROs into fewer packets so fewer SKBs that have to be managed, and fewer um, instances going through the TCP stack. So now you're getting TCP to be able to jump huge numbers at once instead of packet by packet. So getting the kind of the GRO benefit without the software analyzation of each packet. All right, and with that, I think we're done. I would say any questions, but. Um, thank you, David. Uh, that was an exciting talk on multiple fronts. We heard it <laughs> multiple three fronts. Times. The um, amount of AV issues we, in we, one day. No, after I think, I think PJ can compete on that, but we, are, we, are, we heard you three times and saw you twice. So that's good. <laughs> uh, a couple of comments on the web include things like you're a superstar. No, rock superstar. I think is Ooh, <laughs> sweet. Uh, anyway. Who do I owe a beer uh, that to? That was Eric Dumas. Uh, so, yeah, I'll put it up on stage. Uh, yeah, oh. so any, uh, I mean, we are seriously out of time, and like I said, we want to combine questions. So if the, because I think this is the last talk in this series of improving network performance in Linux. So if there is questions along those lines, now is a good time to ask in the next three and minutes. Clearly, people are thinking of the same problems, yeah. going over the same What's set of solutions. There's one. Let's go, let's go. Okay, one question only. And I'll be here the rest of the week, so, you know, I know you'll find me. <laughs> Yeah, just my, my week is ending on Friday. <laughs> just one question. Do you need to use like huge pages or other mechanism to allocate all those queues? Because they are probably will be huge. And like in RDMA, you have all the scatter gather and all those underlying technologies. One of the many benefits of Linux, you, you pick and choose how you want to do things, right? So if you want to use huge pages for your queues, yep. If you want to use huge pages for your memory regions, yeah, it's in your best interest too. So use huge pages when you can. Um, and, yeah, like it continues. It's like wiring things up the Linux way, the way you want to do it for your application and what you need. And I, actually, a very important point because this came up earlier, and I think maybe in John's session as well. You don't actually need huge queues because in the RDMA no. context, your payload is where the size is. You actually want low bloat on your yeah. descriptor, so you want your descriptor rings to be as short as you can. There are clever things you can do in how hardware operates with queues such that you don't have to keep filling the pipe ahead of time and do the BDP thing. But, uh, but, uh, but of course, if you have a choice if you want. Yeah, so for, for RX, as I mentioned, LPC, um, 
it depends on how fast. Like if you're spin polling in the IB module as a way to keep that queue clear, then maybe you can get away with small queues. TX, uh, I think 16, 32 is probably all you need, given the way TCP small queues works. Um, you know, when you're going through the IRQ-based way of going to the networking stack, you know, we had to have 8K depth queues because the, just the sheer time it took from the IRQ firing to software start processing to clear out the descriptors. But in general, I think with this approach, we can we can start looking at smaller and smaller queues to literally just what that application needs. Okay, we have a question. So I thought I was going to get away from more questions, but I guess not. So on the call, um, the question is, um, I guess the stalkers are received using uh, <laughs> stalkers um, are received using multicasts, any bottlenecks, and optimizations for multicast and HFT networks. So the simple answer is yes. There is um, a heavy amount of multicast traffic that is used, um, especially on the trading side. Um, so far, bottlenecks, not really, but uh, it is one of those things if you start messing with your multicast groups and make a mistake, then you have multicast storms, and that's really, really bad. Um, yeah, there really hasn't been a whole bunch of work in that space. Um, it just kind of works. Like, we set it up. Um, they're not exactly the most straightforward things to set up, um, but we get them running and then kind of leave them alone. It's not, not a very exciting answer, so sorry. <laughs> Okay. Any uh, anyone? Which one? Uh, John Clemens saying he's wondering what kind of network you were using. No, he said he said it's it's not okay to ask, and I said yes, it's not okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. we it's it's a Xilinx thing running a device, but this conversation. Oh yeah, that got kind of wiped out when the audio was messing up. So it's commodity servers with a, an FPGA that's doing this custom logic. So you know us creating the whole concept of being a NIC and writing our descriptors, and then doing this logic for registering the memory regions and stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess that part got dropped. Yeah, and for those who are at the LPC side of it. That's a different FPGA we were dropping payload. This is one where we keep the payload because it's kind of important. And one of the things I showed in the demo is I, I transfer that file and I do an MD5 SOM that says, yeah, see, we, we got the same file, both send and receive, same thing. But, but, but I, think, I think the meta point here is that for the purpose of this conversation, that device is actually not that interesting. Like in the yeah, sense exactly. that there isn't a characteristic of the device that we are talking about here. We, we believe... There are things we are doing which will make a bunch of uh, of these interactions much more efficient. Some of the things that were pointed out by our academic colleagues. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but the general structure that David is talking about is actually transcendent. It doesn't matter what device you have underneath. In fact, if you saw his hookbacks, they're to standard NetDev interfaces and to standard TCP calls. So there is nothing yeah. that is device specific. The way I've kind of summarized it is it's just this beauty. The one good thing about the IB verbs interface, well, I'm sure so there's many. I shouldn't. I'm not here to insult the RDMA crowd at all. I'm just here to pull the, pull the good things that we think are, are excellent. This notion of having vendor unique provider hooked into the IB verbs layer that can communicate with a vendor specific driver and the kernel that understands the hardware. So you get this, you know, this, this really good synergy between the layers to to get what you need performance wise. So I do have a question for you. Um, so I think the last time that we really seriously talked about RDMA interacting with the TCP IP stack was, and some people may remember the P TCP port space patch that has been annihilated in time. <laughs> um, so uh, when you guys are actually consuming the socket on the RDMA side, how, how are you actually handling that within the stack? How does the NVMe driver and the kernel handle the socket? Right? I, I, I so can take that. We don't. The socket's, the socket's handed off to the module, and it's just feeding through the standard socket hooks that allow data to go through it and, and receive from. All right, guys, I, can, can I, we? Can yeah. we, we can take this offline, uh, the, but the one sentence answer is 
the moment the socket has moved into the RDMA domain, it's not a socket anymore. That's the Well, when point. you say RDMA domain, it's really the concept of someone tending to data coming in, Correct. sending it through the TCP hooks. All right, I'm going to start singing yeah. now. Yeah. People can. Well, no, people no, like can, everyone can leave like if you want. I mean, people yeah, who want to stick around and talk, we, we I'll, I'll talk about this until I fall over from lack of food. I don't think there are any. Oh, wait, there is a question. Comment on HF. Uh, yeah, we'll take this. So that, that's an important yeah. thing, though, is that we made no, no real kernel changes were necessarily needed to make this happen. We're just wiring things up with some glue yeah. and using existing hooks that other kernel modules it's, like it's rockstar glue but it's glue. Uh, so we, we have to stop here because we are going to miss lunch at this point uh if there is interest uh signal david or me and we can set up a lounge and we can talk more thank you yeah.